All right, hopefully everything's working now. So I foolishly, well, I had to drive this morning uh, to take my uh, daughter to a doctor's appointment. I foolishly drove up here thinking that, you know, the parking lot that was labeled as a BU flex permit parking lot, I'd be able to park it, but I was wrong. So that was my adventure for today. This is why I don't drive normally, but here we go. Um, so we're talking about models and EV testing today. Uh, no announcements per se, um, but let's start off with talking about models. So a model is a set of assumptions about the data. In data science, many models involve assumptions about processes that involve randomness, like chance models. Um, and basically what it comes down to is does the model fit the data? So how many people here have heard the term model when we talk about uh, data science like this? All right, can you tell me uh, like some context in which you've heard it? Um, I don't know, it's just a way of visualizing data. So a way of visualizing data, I would say it's um, it's kind of more the root of that. Like the visualization is something you apply on top of the model. Um, so the model is really the thing that does the work. Um, I think these days you most commonly hear it in terms of machine learning. Um, so how many here have heard of machine learning? All right, so that's pretty good. So basically the machine learning is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's when the computer learns something. Um, and by we use the term learning in this context very loosely. So that may be they're learning by doing some math to do some sort of predictions. But it can also mean learning as in they're doing, they're putting ideas together uh, and we're not quite sure how they're doing that and then spitting out predictive results. Uh, so it kind of runs the whole gamut. All right, so, but anything that we're we're trying to figure out uh, like how something works, we can call a model, okay? All right, so an assessment is, again, kind of like what it sounds like. Um, basically, this is how we define, is the model doing what it claims to be doing, okay? Which is, you know, is it actually modeling the data? Uh, and so we use some sort of assessment to figure out whether or not that model is uh, in fact modeling the data. Um, sometimes, and this is actually kind of where, why I stress like the complement stuff, is sometimes you actually can assess it by looking at the inverse of what you really care about. Uh, sometimes it's easier to prove the inverse than it is to prove the thing you're actually looking for. We'll talk about that more some more. We'll talk about that more later. All right, so, but a model is all about, sorry, I kind of skipped over this, but a model is kind of all about being able to take a set of data and then making a prediction that is in line with, or at least close to uh, what we would find if we actually observed it. All right, so our first example talks about jury selection. Um, and the first thing I want to explain is uh, what a jury is, okay? so. Um, if you grew up in the US, uh, you are probably familiar with this concept, but basically, and I mean, there are, there are juries worldwide as well, but uh, the way the American uh, justice system works is, you know, in a particular way. Uh, and so in the US, what we have is a jury, which is the group of people who actually decide a case. Okay, so you have a lawyer on one side, and you have a lawyer on the other side, and you have a judge who's making sure everybody follows the rules. But the two lawyers are trying to argue the case. But ultimately, in not all cases, but some kinds of uh, court cases, a jury is who actually makes the decision. A jury is made up of what are referred to as lay people or people who don't have any experience with often the topic at hand, like whatever is being decided on, um, and also don't have a lot of experience with the law itself. The way you get a jury is by you create what's usually referred to as a jury panel, um, where you get a theoretically randomly selected group of people who then you pick the jury from. Anybody have any ideas why you don't just pick the number of people uh, that you need on the jury? Like, why is there a panel first? Because you have to 
Right. So that's what this whole case is about. So we'll we'll let that just sit for a minute. But like I said, we're just going to let that sit for a minute. Do uh, you have any other ideas? Well, you want a lot of redundancy in case certain people don't make sense to serve in the panel, like if they have pre in the jury. Biases. Yeah, exactly. So basically, the big thing is redundancy. Uh, as you're kind of saying, it's not it's not really redundant as much as from the hundred you may you know you might have to if you want to choose twelve. You don't want any lawyers in that 12, for example. You don't want any judges in that 12. And theoretically, they could be in the mix, right? You may have a juror who's not actually available for whatever period of time that you happen to select and your initial criterion didn't uh, you know, weed them out for some reason. And then through most jury selection process, the lawyers actually get to interview the members of the panel uh, and strike certain people from the jury uh, for uh, basically they can have no reason at all for a certain number of them and they can have uh, a set of reasons that they're allowed to to strike them for example this person is a lawyer so they shouldn't be on the jury um, so uh, that's just a bit of context um, also if you grew up in the U.S. Uh, how many people have read 12 Angry Men all right so at least for me, it was like really beaten into me over and over again that a jury is always 12 people. That is not actually true in the US. Uh, juries can actually be a bunch of different sizes. They're usually like multiples of six. So it's like six, 12 and 18, but depending on the kind of court case, they can have different sizes. Um, so I just always thought that was a funny fact. Um, okay, so what we're talking about here is uh, in a county in Alabama, um, and a county is what states in the US are made up of, uh, and one of them is called Talladega, and it's in Alabama. I think it has a really famous car race, um, but I could be mixing up terms because I'm not a fan of car racing. Um, but so this guy, uh, Robert Swain, was convicted of a crime. Um, and one of the things the US justice system allows you to do is um, bring uh, basically what's called an appeal if you can find something wrong with your original trial. Okay, and so he argued that um, his jury uh, when in his original trial was all white. And so therefore, as a black man, uh, he didn't get a fair trial. Okay, um, just by way of context, at the time, uh, 1965, um, only men who were 21 years or older were allowed to serve on a jury. Okay, so that does kind of shorten the, the population. And we won't get into the reasons for that right now. Um, those rules have, you know, since changed. I think you have to be 18 and you can be a man or a woman. Um, but in Talladega County, 26% of the population was black. So in other words, if you were choosing your panel of 100 men, 26% um, of that you would think should be black, right? However, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, what actually happened was in the 100 men, only eight were black, okay? And so none of them appeared on the jury, but even then, right, is eight 26% of 100? How many would you expect it to be? 26, right? Uh, okay, so now what? There, there are ways that that could happen theoretically, right? If it was, you know, maybe you got, 22, right? And it was kind of close and you just had a bad draw, right? Um, but you could also theoretically, right, have more. You could have 30 because you had a different kind of draw. But so he was arguing, and the reason he got his appeal, or, or the reason he got to go and fight this case was that um, because he said that it shouldn't have been an all white jury, uh, statistically. This case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, and this is, okay, so the Supreme Court makes final decisions primarily on matters of what's referred to as constitutional law. So basically kind of the rules of jurisprudence, not necessarily, uh, or at least rarely does the Supreme Court decide like an actual case. They kind of more like decide on the rules that cases should be under. So the Supreme Court ruling about the disparities between the percentages and the eligible population on the jury panel, the Supreme Court wrote, the overall percentage disparity, basically eight out of 100 versus 26 out of 100, 
has been small and reflects no studied attempt to include or exclude a specified number of, and we won't get into the word we don't use anymore, um, but that is in the quote. So let's say, um, and this is a common practice, you all are data scientists, okay? And you're asked to serve as an expert in this matter, okay? So you, the Supreme Court justices uh, ask you, is, does this model hold up, basically? Is eight out of 100 a realistic outcome if the jury stand, panel selection process were truly unbiased? Sometimes when I'm trying to read out loud, it's really good that the words are there because I, I stumble over. Um, so, what? Well, let's take a look, right? So, oh, sorry, let me go. Oh, this is a new slide, sorry. I thought it was uh, just a dull slide. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample from the population and we're going to try to see what we get for the results of a population. You know, so if we take a hundred people, we'll, what, what's that population gonna look like? Um, so we're going to pull samples at random from the population, and we're going to and this this app of this uh, function will actually return an array containing the distribution of categories in the sample. All right, now we have it. <laughs> Maybe. Come on. There we go. All right. So let me just find my cheat sheet. Just going very slowly today. All right. So the first thing we want to do is we want to create an array. It has two elements, okay. In this case, uh, we could do we could do more elements. We had more uh, population breakdown, but in this case, we want to do uh, two. I mean, I'm just gonna say like two numbers, right? One number we want to be the percent that we expect the black population to be, and one number that we expect the white population to be. So, what are those two numbers going to be that we put in there? What are the two, what are the proportions we need uh, to represent the, let's just for the sake of simplicity, the black population on the left and the white population on the right? Yeah. Is it Correct. Eventually. All right, so we do it basically just in terms of, Oops. So we just do it in terms of it being a percentage, right? So these we just have two parts of the population that we care about in this particular instance. Uh, so we put them in uh, into an array, um, and now we want to sample from that array. Or, uh, sorry, we want to sample a uh, hundred people with that array. Uh, with that population breakdown. So we're going to throw 100 in here. And now, and so what we get is a population result, okay, that is, uh, you know, it's kind of like random sampling here. So, for example, we should get different values, see, but they're all going to be kind of close because. What we're doing is we're taking a random sample of 100 and looking at what is the actual population proportion we got out, but what we want it to be is in like kind of starting in this neighborhood. Does that make sense? I find this very hard to explain, so feel free to ask more questions. Yeah. So this. We did a we did a sampling yeah. of a hundred. Yeah. Okay, so we, we had a big you know barrel and we pulled out a hundred uh, marbles, right? Mm -hmm. And in the barrel, 
are 26% black marbles and 74% white marbles. So I grab 100 out and then I count them. I got 27 black marbles and 73 white marbles on that one. So I can run it again and I'll get, this time I got 24 marbles and 76 marbles. Right. Right. It doesn't really matter what the population is because we know what the percentages are. Exactly. All right. So then we're going to do that as a function so that we can call it a lot of times without me running that same cell over and over again. Oops. I have to run this cell. I also have red. Ah, thank you. Oh, that's because I'm supposed to. Oh, yeah. So out of this function, though, I only want um, in that array, I only want the first number, right? So I just want the 27, 26, 23, uh, whatever, the, the representation of the, the black population that we got back when we ran that sample. And that's why it was erring because I forgot I was supposed to write a bit more code. Okay, so I call the function and I get a 22 that time. So we want to get, computer's on the wrong side today. So let's do that a whole bunch of times. Let's say a thousand. And we're going to try to make it so that it's a little easier to work with by uh, converting it back to like kind of a regular number rather than a decimal or a percentage. Um, and we're going to basically, and I think you've seen this before, but so for one to a thousand time, we're going to do a new panel. We're going to basically, we're going to run that same thing again. Then we're going to just shove it into this array. And so we should end up with an array with a thousand runs of the sample. Okay, now we're going to display it. Let me see if I missed any code over here. I don't think so. All right. But because we're talking about a distribution, we want to use a histogram. So what we see is, I think, what at least intuitively for this. I, I, it's a pretty wide range, right? Like, um, what we see here is that they cluster around 26, right? So we run it for a thousand times, and the distribution of the, you know, kind of the that black population is right around 26 most of the time, right? Or a lot of the time. Um, and but the range, you know, might be a little bit bigger than you might expect, right? In that it goes all the way down to 14 and all the way up to 40. Okay. However, what do you not see here? Right. So as an expert testifying before the Supreme Court, you would say this is impossible. If there isn't some other controlling factor than random selection. So I think. So, uh, so that's kind of that story. Um, I want to go back to the slides now. And talk about a different case. Okay, so I, I you know, so jury selection has in general gotten much better uh, than it was in, what did I say, 1865, 1865, right? 1960. Please tell me it's 18. Oh, good God. All right. So 1965, it's gotten better. Uh, there are still lots of problems with this, uh, mostly, you know, socioeconomic status has a lot to do with how your jury panel ends up. Um, but long story short, uh, that's the idea. And, you know, uh, as a data scientist, right, you can answer this question, right? You can actually show pretty much unequivocally that their argument is false. All right, so um, going on to another example, 
uh, we'll talk about genetics. Um, and has anybody ever heard of uh, Gregor Mendel? All right, anybody know what he's kind of known for? Yeah, so the founder, father of genetics, um, and he was super into peas, which I think this is the Google logo. It's supposed to be like a Google draw, draw, what do they call them? Google Doodle, that's it. Yeah. Um, but uh, unlike last semester, I went and actually found a picture of a pea flower for you. Um, so if you, has anybody ever grown peas? Yeah, they have pretty flowers, don't they? Um, but uh, so I think I had to do it like in school, like, um, but uh, I never grew anything at home because I lived in the inner city and growing things didn't go well. So, um, but basically what he did was he said, okay, we have two different kinds of pea plants. Uh, they have purple flowers or they have white flowers. Um, and each plant is purple flowering with a chance of 75%, regardless of the colors of the other plants. And so the question is, is this a good model? So this is essentially a, a hypothesis, right? Um, but it's kind of got a model in there that we can use from a prediction perspective. That makes sense? All right. Um, the, the thing to remember also in this is that when we're talking about this, um, you have all probably taken enough genetics at this point that you knew more than he did when he started doing these experiments, right? So just keep in mind when he was doing this work, it was quite a while ago and he's the father of the stuff. So, uh, you know, so some, I think it seems really obvious to us now, uh, but you know, hindsight's 2020, right? Um, okay, so what we wanna do is choose this statistic so we're gonna take a sample and see what percent are purple flowers. And if that percent is much larger or much smaller than 75, that is evidence against the model, okay? But one of the things that we're gonna see here, which we didn't really see in the last example, is that the distance from 75 is really what matters, okay? Does anybody know what this, what these bars mean on the outside? Okay, can you tell us what absolute value is? So it's distance from zero uh, or the short and you know, easy version, you drop the negative side if it has one. Um, because what we care about, right, is how far away it is from the thing. We don't care that it's going left or if it's going right, or for you, I suppose, right and left. But, um, and then, yeah, I knew there was like a when to run the slides, mistake in here. Um, okay, so, oh, sorry. So if the statistic is large, that's evidence against the model, right? So if we're, the further away we are from the 75, the less likely it is to be true. So let's look at that. Okay, so. Peter is totally on the wrong side today. All right, so what he did was he actually went and planted a bunch of pea plants. Does anybody have any idea why he chose pea plants versus, I don't know, some other kind of plant? They grow fast and, and bear new, new plants quickly. So you can do 929 plants in like a reasonable amount of time. So that's why he experimented with people. Okay, so how do we know what the percentage of purple flowers would be? Anyone? Or what's the probability of a purple flower? Anybody else? Yeah. So 709 divided by 929. Right? And so his kind of his original like observed experiment seems pretty close, right? So what can we do with that? Well, 
What if we want to do the same thing we were doing before, except this time with our pea plants, and we're gonna do a population size of 929, okay? And so our first try, we get 72% were purple flowers and 27% were white flowers. So what we wanna do is basically the same thing we were doing before, which is we're gonna just plug in, oops, we're gonna multiply by 100 again. So we get uh, a number that is not, you know, kind of above one. Um, oops, I thought I ran the next one already. And so if we run this function multiple times, we'll get different results. Um, and so now we're at 77 versus our first one was at 70, 73. Um, and so, you know, so we're seeing that, that movement around or potentially around 75. But now we're going to try to prove it instead of just assuming it's true by running it a thousand times again. And what am I forgetting? That might be it. All right. So now I have probably shouldn't have printed that array, um, but I have a lot of flowers. Or I'm uh, sorry. Actually, I have. Uh, the number of purple flowers, right? A lot of times on a draw of 929 flowers from a population that is 75 and 25%. So, what would be a lot more useful, right? Is to look at that with a histogram. And so this is the percent of purple flowers in a sample of 929. Um, and, you know, 75 is looking pretty good, right? Kind of right there in the middle, um, you know, going all the way down to 70, 71, um, and all the way up to almost 80. Um, but, you know, kind of the bulk of that is between like 74 and 76. So that looks pretty good. Oh, and then, but, in order to kind of measure that distance, we're going to use maybe a new function. Um, oh my goodness. Actually, let me do this. It'll be a little bit easier. Okay, so we're going to use the new, or potentially new, I can't remember if we use it or not, um, abs, which, uh, like all things, uh, is short for something else. So that's short for absolute value. Um, if you're ever doing any programming in any other languages, ABS is pretty consistently the short form of absolute value. And so what we want to do is purples minus 75. And there's something missing. Oh, that's good. And then we can run a histogram again. But now, instead of having to kind of figure it out for ourselves, we can see how our model did, right? So the closer to zero, the better, or the more likely our model is correct. Does that make sense? All right. And then I think we're going to go to the slides now. Oh. Sorry, I, I have one more thing in here and I don't remember why I have it. So we're not gonna talk about that one. Um, all right. Oh, that's why there was a demo pop-up. All right, so two viewpoints. So basically we have the model and then the alternative, okay? So in the jury selection case, we had the model, which is the people on the jury panels were selected at random. Purple and alternative is basically, it's not that, right? Um, so these are examples, right? They can often get quite a bit more sophisticated, um, but you, know, you can even have multiple alternatives. But the idea is that you have 
not only the thing that is your kind of hypothesis, the thing you want to be true or you expect to be true, but also you have a counter, okay? And the more directly opposite that counter, the better, okay? And so the way we go about assessing the model to find out whether it meets the model's rules, well, we talked about, yeah, we'll talk about it in a minute, but we have some formal terminology for what uh, these pieces are called, um, but they're in a further slide. So we'll get to that in a minute. So we choose a statistic to measure the discrepancy between the model and the data. Okay, so we find something that we think is representative of whatever we want to know. Um, and then we simulate that stat under the model's assumptions. And then we compare the data to the model's predictions. So we can look at the histogram of the simulated values of the statistic, right? Because when I was running that purple flowers method over and over and over again, that's a simulation, right? It's not a real, I'm not actually observing pea plants anymore. I'm just making a simulation, okay? So then I can compute the observed statistic from the real sample. And if they're similar, that probably means that my simulation is good, right? As well as that my model is good. Is this making sense? Okay. So then we move into another way of talking about this called A B testing. Uh, does anybody know what A B testing is? Uh, let's see. Anybody over there? That side of the room seems bored. A B testing. Anybody know what it is? All right, we'll give it to you then. All right, I'll give you two different answers. Tell me which one you like more. Okay. All right. All right. So on one hand, A/B testing is when you have a group of users, and they'll show 50% of them the uh, process A and 50% of them B. It could be something as simple as like a change, a slight change to the Google color scheme. Yeah. So you can see, okay, which one are people responding to more, and you can take that data back and then use it to inform your decision. Because it's, it's you have. You don't have a control group so much in, in using A-B testing, but you do get uh, a very clear response on both different types. Okay. Do you have another example? No, that was an example okay. of A-B testing. Okay. So, uh, so exactly, this is an exactly an example. Uh, we'll talk about what it is kind of more formally in a minute, but um, by way of further example, um, how many people here know who Hillary Clinton is? All right. So during her campaign, what, 2016? Yeah. Um, uh, she had a very sophisticated tech team. Um, and one of the things they have, right, is they have a website for her. And on that website, there is a donate button of some kind, right, that says, give money to this candidate. Um, and they did a, an A-B test about where that button was on the page, basically. Um, <clears throat> excuse me and resulted in something like a 20 or 30 percent increase in donations based on moving the button right so a b testing is very very important um, and really does come in really really handy when you're like developing websites um, but sorry <coughs> the term is pretty pervasive in lots of different fields you can do it with lots of different things and in the context of data science uh we're going to talk about what we mean by that all right, so when we were talking about taking the two different sets of samples and we're doing samples across group A with the value of the sample individuals in group B, do they come from the same underlying distribution? Well, we answer the question by performing a statistical test and that's called A-B testing. Um, so that may not be 100% clear, so hopefully the demo will be better. <coughs> And next one. So, oh, one second, help me. All right, so we're going to look at this table about uh, like uh, children birth weight. Okay, uh, so just to Sorry, I gotta drink something before I keep coughing. Oh, 
and the, the water bottle is dripping. Um, so uh, this is the weight of the baby at birth, um, and it's in ounces. Uh, this is the number of days that the woman was pregnant before they gave birth. This is the age of the mother. This is the height of the mother. This is the weight of the mother while she was pregnant. And then this is whether or not she smoked during the pregnancy. Okay, so it doesn't indicate whether she ever smoked or ever smoked in the future, just during the pregnancy. All right, and so. If somebody could tell me what the, like if all I want to look at in this particular study is the smoke, you know, whether or not the mother was a smoker and what the birth weight of the baby was, what uh, method would I use? Yeah, select. And so it doesn't get angry about spacing. All right, and so I've put that into a new table. called smoking and birth weight. Um, and then <clears throat> let's look at the number of kind of samples we have in this data set of the mothers who smoked um, and, you know, and or sorry, the mothers who smoked and the mothers who didn't smoke. Uh, so 459 who did and 715 who didn't. Um, and then we can look at kind of a histogram of those two groups overlaid to each other. All right. So, if I have a theory about why I'm looking at this, or or why we're talking about this, what is the what's interesting about uh, baby birth weight and maternal smoking? And some of it is right there in the data. <laughs> yeah. Right. So there's, and I think probably most people in here know this by now, right? Um, because this study was done quite a number of years ago now. Um, but basically what they discovered is that women who smoke uh, tend to have lighter birth, uh, birth weight babies. Um, and there's actually uh, a number of other interesting uh, kind of fallouts from that as well. Um, those lower birth weight babies also tend to be um, more obese later in life and have other kinds of issues as well. Um, but kind of there's, there's a lot of data surrounding lower birth weight babies. Uh, <coughs> shouldn't talk so much. Sorry. So there's a lot of data around, obviously within, um, Kind of, uh, uh, sorry, like uh, like racial conditions or whatever. Um, but if you're if you're low in the class of birth weight, you will tend to have more problems later in life than if you are a larger baby. Um, and one of the things that comes is that if you were a mother who was smoking and uh, pregnant, you would tend to have a lower birth weight baby. All right. So we have this data. And, you know, so we wanted to take the sample population. I was going back to the slides um, because this is how we start. Oops. Looking at our testing. All right. So, what we want to know, right, in this scenario is. Is it chance or is there a correlation between, or a causation even, right? Causal relationship between the mothers who smoke and uh, the birth weights of those babies? And I kind of gave you the answer already, but I would be really surprised if there was anybody in here who didn't already know this. Um, so, but we're going to prove it, right? So, this is what, this is the slide I was talking about before. Um, that I kind of feel like maybe should be earlier in the lecture. But, so we have two hypotheses, okay? We have what's called the null hypothesis, and we have the alternative. Anybody have a theory as to why it's called the null hypothesis? 
it took me a while to figure out. It's like a bait I bought the boat with that yeah, almost. There's a, there's a keyword I was looking for that you didn't say. Um, you had an idea over there? Um, right. So, so you remember the histogram where we did the absolute value? The closer we were to zero, so zero, no, nothing. So I was looking for the zero. Uh, so the no hypothesis, that's kind of the hypothesis you're looking to prove. Okay. Um, and so in this case, in the population distribution of the birth weights, the babies in the two groups are the same. They are different in the sample just due to chance. Is that what we thought we were trying to prove? No, right? Um, and the reason is, is because this is one of those scenarios where proving the inverse is actually a better choice than trying to prove the thing we kind of really want to know. Does anybody have any theories as to why? Because this is much easier to prove, right? Because there's fewer things going on. <clears throat> so long story short, we have the null hypothesis and we have the alternative. Uh, and these are the things we're trying to prove. All right, so a little bit of a digression. How are we doing on time? Yeah, okay. Um, so just from a kind of terminology perspective, if you hear someone say in the tail, this is what they mean, okay? So basically it's one of these kind of far end outliers. Um, has anybody ever heard of long tail uh, internet or long tail retail? All right, so, uh, most of you probably do your shopping online at someplace like Amazon, okay? Those are what we usually refer to as like big retailers. The distribution of people who shop at those places is in here, right? Does that make sense? You know, most people do a lot of their shopping there. So there's been a lot of uh, tech companies that have been looking to be, to try to, if you can capture this right or this and this that's still quite a lot of shopping right even if it isn't as much as this or as easy as this if you can grab these parts that's actually quite a lot of business so what that's referred to as is going after the long tail so if you imagine instead of this kind of relatively like tall narrow distribution you know the distribution going out more like this it's a long tail and so companies like, say, ever used Etsy, for example. So this is part of Etsy's model, okay? Is that very specialized little shops that appeal to very specialized or very, you know, specific individual uh, situations. One you're less likely to hear of, although they've improved their brand recognition. We ever heard of a company called Wayfair? Okay, so Wayfair is actually based in the Boston area. Um, their original thing was uh, to put up a website like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something like, uh, like bestcouches.com. Okay, so like really, really specific. Um, and then basically it was a reskinned Wayfair site that was just couches. And that was it. Okay, so that they could go after this market segment over here by going very, very targeted. Okay, so they didn't do the Etsy thing of being handmade and you know all that kind of stuff or letting people sell for them. But what they did was they did they just went and bought like every domain they could get and they put they wrote software that would generate retail sites that went under them. And it was a really cool model. And then I don't know, a few years ago, uh, they started to actually feel like they had enough of a brand now that they could actually go sell things as Wayfair. Um, and then there's all kinds of uh, internet like trolling around them too. If you want to talk about that more, uh, let me know after class sometime. All right, so kind of more terminology. Um, we tend to use these kinds of words when we're talking about this stuff. A lot of this, it's not slang or maybe jargon. It doesn't really have the like totally formal definitions. But so we talk about something being inconsistent with the null, okay? So that's, that's what we say when we mean it's not 
quite that, right? It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't get close to the null uh, because there's nothing, it's not wrong, right? It's just not consistent with the null hypothesis, okay? I always forget that I can actually read that one up there. Um, in the tail area is usually less than 5%. So if you hear someone say that something is in the tail, it's usually less than the 5% marker on the distribution on a histogram. If a result is statistically significant, um, sorry, uh, so in the tail, so if it's statistically significant, it's less than 5%, but then if it's highly statistically significant, it's less than 1%. Okay. But these are, like I said, they're, they're jargony, slangy terms, right? So just because you see that doesn't necessarily mean that they're talking about that. They actually mean 1%. And you should always check your, uh, you know, kind of check for the actual data. Um, and one of my favorite terms in uh, kind of this field uh, is called key hacking, which is when you muck with this number, but still say things like highly statistically significant. Um, and so what it means is basically like, we'll talk about P, I thought we were gonna get it to it today, but P is basically the measure that you use to talk about these things. Um, and so you say cool stuff like, oh, it's highly statistically significant, but you actually mean that it's 5%. You follow me? So, like I said, it's slangy. Make sure you know what it means uh, before trusting it. And here we have a question. Maybe. Where is my super mouse? All right. So, what is statistically significant? generally All right. All right, looks pretty good. So less than 5%. Let's see, we got another question. Let's see what that is. So a highly statistically significant refers to the tail as being what percent? Uh -huh. All right, get those answers in. I'm going to call it. And it looks like most people got it, so less than 1%. Um, and then let's talk about p value just a little bit. So, the p value, empirical distribution of the test, of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. So, basically, this section, right? And then the red dot is the observed statistic in this example, um, right? So this is one of the stats we got, so it's kind of in the main area. Um, but so that's, we're gonna start talking about this p-value thing as a way to indicate uh, like the quality of our sample, like or of our, of our test runs to see if we, what we did is actually uh, kind of giving us a valid, estimate of what we think the prediction should be. Um, and so the definition of the p-value is the observed significance level. Um, and the reason we call it the p-value rate right, is because it's usually written as a p. 
Okay, it's not because it's like an acronym. So if the null hypothesis is true, um, that the test statistic is equal to the Oh, yeah. So the, so the p value is the chance that if the null hypothesis is true and that the test, it's just test statistic, I cannot say that, is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction of the alternative. Okay. So what we're looking for is the alternative, right? So we kind of want to be in that direction. So what we are usually looking for is something that is highly statistically significant where the alternative is the hypothesis that we really care about. All right, we're gonna have a lot of examples. So don't worry about it if you don't completely get it yet. Um, but I think we're gonna pause there because I remembered to bring the prize. And where did I write their name down? 